Um, my name's Liam and I'm one of the keepers here um, at Zoop to You. So this week we've been talking all about um, pets. So not necessarily cats and dogs and hamsters and things like that. Um, we're talking about things like um, snakes and parrots um, and a couple more um, different kind of exotic pets that you might um, you might not find in you know your local pet shop, um, but they might you might sell them in uh, exotic pet shops. So we've actually got two today, um, <clears throat> two different animals that we're going to show you. Uh, two very similar animals in the way that uh, they need looking after and stuff like that. So some of the stuff I say might be a little bit repeated, um, but it's important that you know um, both aspects if you if you're thinking about getting one of these animals you need to know all about that specific animal. So I'm just gonna uh, give a quick mention to the light behind me. I know it's flickering, uh, this side. I know it's flickering, but don't worry about it. Um, it's not, you know, it's not uh, turning off or anything like that. It's actually on a thermostat, um, which can, which regulates the temperature really. So um, we're gonna be speaking about thermostats today because we have got uh, a couple of reptiles. Uh, so I'll go into that a little bit more, but it is supposed to be flickering. So. Um, sorry if it's a bit annoying, but um, it is supposed to be flickering, so don't worry about it. So before we start, we have had a message um, from William, who is really, really looking forward to meeting Boris today um, because his gran actually adopted Boris. Um, so um, she's uh, gone onto our, our website or emailed Melissa and spoken about our adoption packages, and she's actually adopted Boris. So she's, she's actually going to get the chance to meet Boris one-to-one um, -one. and if you guys are interested in adopting any of our animals uh, get in touch the email is just on the bottom of the page um, and like I say you get a chance to, to meet Boris um, or the an animal of your choice any animal that we've got here at the zoo one-to-one <clears throat> um, -one with a keeper so you get some really really good time with them so um, hopefully this this talk will um, encourage you guys to, to want to adopt one of our animals as well so before we get started and meet both of our animals today, we're just going to talk to you about the daily homework. Um, and what we want to, you guys to do is create a leaflet on each pet species that you meet. So uh, we want them to include loads of different things, uh, such as housing, diet, enrichment, vet care, special considerations, and good and bad things, so pros and cons. We're actually looking at tortoises and bearded dragons today. So that doesn't mean you have to make two. If you want to make two, that's great. Um, you can just pick one of the ones that we've spoken about today, or you could even pick a completely different one. If you guys have got um, an exotic pet that we don't have here at the zoo, feel free to uh, to use that as your uh, your focus animal for your leaflet, um, <clears throat> because you know we want we want loads of different ideas for this. So um, don't think you you have to do the animals we've spoken about. Um, but if you do want to do the animals we've spoken about, because hopefully I'm going to tell you quite a lot about them. Um, then that's good as well. So the main thing to consider when you have pets anywhere, you know, even at, at the zoo here, especially um, at all zoos around the country, um, but pets, because for pets, we can't really give them as much space as we can give them at a zoo. We need to make sure we're 100% following the five freedoms. Now, I know we, we've touched on this earlier in the week, or we're just going to go through it again just because it's an extremely important part of keeping a pet, especially an exotic pet, um, because they usually have more uh, care uh, needs. <clears throat> so, you know, domestic animals such as cats and dogs, they've been domesticated over millions of years. Animals such as um, tortoises and snakes um, and lizards uh, they're, they're more recent, you know, that they've that they've, that they've actually been domesticated. So the, the five freedoms are really, really important for these types of animals. So the first one is freedom from hunger and thirst. And that's not just, um, you know, feeding them over and over and over again, um, because you need to make sure they're on the correct diet. Number one, very, very important. Uh, and number two, they're, they're, they're on weight management. So that basically means <clears throat> if I'm feeding my bearded dragon every single day, He's going to get fat because he's not going to eat in the wild every single day. And even though he is technically a domesticated animal, he's still got the exact same needs um, and the exact same body shape and uh, all the rest of it as a wild bearded dragon. So he's not going to eat in the wild every day. So I'm definitely not going to feed him every day. 
Um, so even though it's freedom from hunger and thirst, you need to make sure you're doing the right thing as well. So not just feeding them every single day um, uh, and making sure you're giving them the correct diet as well. Freedom from discomfort. So as it says on the slide, providing an appropriate environment, including shelter um, and a comfortable resting area. Again, just 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 the kind of things that they'll get in the wild is, um, you know, is appropriate. Anything um, above that is really, really good because, you know, we want to spoil our pets and stuff like that. Um, but you don't have to go over the top with, with with this kind of thing. As long as they've got, um, you know, the correct environment. So with reptiles, it's especially important to um, to give them heat uh, because they're cold-blooded um, and, you know, somewhere where they can get out of that heat as well. So you want a hot spot and a cold spot, ideally. So for the tortoises and the bearded dragons, they need somewhere where they can also get away from um, the heat if they want to as well. Freedom from pain, injury and disease is pretty much self-explanatory. Um, you know, we don't want our animals to get injured. We don't want them to get hurt. We definitely don't want them to get diseases. Really, really easy to uh, keep on top of in captivity if we just regularly take them to the vets, um, give them their, uh, their, their annual treatment, their biannual treatment, um, make sure they're having supplements on the food. Um, that's very, very important. Um, to avoid things like MBD, which is really common in reptiles. Um, and basically just making sure they, they're commonly visiting the vets. And if you see any differences in your pets, that's when you know there's something wrong. So having a pet for a long time is um, really good. Once you've had it for about a year or, or you know, a bit, even maybe a bit less than a year, you get to know that animal really, really well because you're seeing it every day. So you'll get to know its its routines, its behavior patterns and things like that. And if you notice anything that's out of the ordinary, uh, then that could potentially be uh, injury um, or pain or disease. So it's worth getting that checked out. Freedom to express normal behavior. So um, that is basically as much as possible. We're never going to be able to provide these animals with um, exactly the right amount of space um, that they get in the wild because both of these animals um, are uh, they, they, they span wide areas so Boris especially living in the desert he's got to go around a, a big uh, area to, to find food because obviously in the desert food is really really scarce and we're never going to be able to provide that for him in, in captivity so we basically want to try and um, help him to do natural behaviours like hunting for insects and stuff like that by providing him with enrichment. Uh, you might not think enrichment's important for reptiles, but it is extremely important. And we'll touch on that a little bit more when we actually talk about the, the specific species. But uh, expressing normal behaviour is basically just, um, it basically just means that they're not performing stereotypical behaviours. Um, so they're not getting really, really bored number one, really important. Um, and then if you've seen any stereotypical behaviours such as pacing, bearded dragons might pace up and down their, their vivarium. Um, they might also self-mutilate, so they, they can start scratching themselves and uh, the tortoises can start biting themselves. And that's just because they're really, really bored. So uh, that means they need more stuff to do. They're not expressing normal behaviours. They're actually expressing abnormal behaviours. So um, normal behaviour is really, really important for them. The last one is freedom from fear and distress. So that basically means the conditions that they're kept in um, means that they're not going to be distressed. And as I've mentioned, once you get to know your pets, um, you get really, really uh, like well acquainted with them. And if they do something differently, um, then you can uh, you can spot that straight away, basically. So say, for example, if we was to move Boris from where his viv is now in the reptile room and put it across from one of our big snakes. Boris isn't going to like that. He's he's going to be really, really stressed by that. And that's where he gets kept the whole time as well. So um, that's not going to be really good for him. So even in terms of where, where you're placing your other animals, if that other animal is a potential predator of that animal, which snakes definitely are for Boris, then we need to make sure uh, we're thinking about that as well. We don't want to put him opposite a snake because um, that's going to be really, really stressful for him. So we're actually going to go on and meet our two animals now. We'll do them one by one. But first and foremost, I'll introduce you to Herbert. 
Now I'm glad I've got Herbert rather than one of the silk art torches because hopefully I won't get weed on. So this is Herbert. He looks really, really grumpy, um, but he's actually really friendly. Uh, he doesn't mind being picked up. He tries to walk off your hand like he is doing now, um, but he's not going to be able to go anywhere because I've, I've got him uh, by the shell. So with tortoises, <clears throat> really, really important when you're keeping them as pets to try your best to stick um, to a wild diet. So the things that they're going to find in the wild are grasses um, and potentially leaves and things like that. Um, other than that, they're not really going to find too much else. So uh, I know loads of people love to feed the tortoises, things like strawberries and carrots and uh, loads of different types of fruit and veg. And that's that's really, really tasty for the tortoises, uh, but not very good for the health. So it can be a little bit detrimental to the health. Um, if you think if we eat McDonald's all the time, we're going to get really unhealthy. Um, it's the same with these guys. So they need um, a really fibrous diet, a really natural diet like grass. Uh, grass is excellent for them. Um, and a few leaves as well. If you want to give them leaves, that's that's fine as well. Just make sure they're the correct ones that they can eat. Um, and then other than that, that's pretty much it. Just just provide them with water as well. So we don't we don't want to be giving them uh, strawberries and uh, and apples and things like that. I mean, if you want to give it to them as a treat now and again, um, then that's good. That if you want to try and train these guys, then they're not gonna the the incentive of grass isn't really going to be. Um, enough for them to want to do stuff. So uh, when I train tortoises, I used pepper. Uh, pepper's a really, really good one that you can use for them um, to train them. So you don't want to be giving it them too much, but for a treat, if you want them to do something, uh, then fruit and veg is fine as well. But um, very, very, uh, you know, in really, really small amounts. Um, otherwise, they're just going to end up getting ill. So it's a little bit uh, strange because he is a reptile. He is cold-blooded but he actually lives in quite a cold country. He's found in loads of different countries. Um, a lot of the time he's found in Central Asia, uh, but he's actually also found in Russia as well. So he's a horsefield tortoise, um, but he can also be called um, a Russian tortoise. Um, and that's really weird because Russia is a really, really cold country for the majority of the year. So what Herbert does to counteract this is he hibernates. So that basically just means he sleeps through the winter. And... Um, in Russia, it can get cold a lot, a lot of the year. So um, up to nine months of the year, it's really, really cold. So that's what that's um, how long Herbert hibernates, hibernates for. Um, he will literally hibernate for nine months of the year. So he's only actually awake for three months. So when he's awake for these three months, he needs to make sure he's eating loads and loads and loads um, to make sure uh, he can actually survive the winter. And then he slows down all his body. Uh, all his organs and everything like that, and then he'll sleep through um, for the nine months. Now, this is something that's a huge debate amongst tortoise keepers, whether or not you should actually let them hibernate in uh, captivity. I'm not going to tell you what's right or wrong, but I'll give you my personal opinion, and that's that tortoises should not be hibernated in captivity. And that's just because them slowing down the body, uh, you know, slowing down the heart and all the other organs and stuff, uh, that can be a real risk. You know, they might not wake up again. Um, and even though you might think it's really, really natural for them to hibernate, the only reason they do it in the wild is because it's cold. You, in, in captivity, tortoise shouldn't be kept in um, somewhere where they feel like it's too cold and they need to hibernate. They should always be kept um, in a nice, warm environment. So as I mentioned on the previous page, we need to give them a hot spot, a hot side where, the, where there's a heat lamp. Uh, and also a cold side where there's no heat lamp. Now that cold side, it's not cold. It's probably gonna be around something like 20 degrees, maybe a little bit more than that. Um, so that's gonna be cold to these because they're cold blooded, they can't warm themselves up like we can. Um, <clears throat> and then the hot side, it's gonna be you know double that, 35, 40 degrees, something like that. And that's gonna be really, really comfortable for, for these guys. It needs to be long enough, their enclosure needs to be long enough for them to um, to be able to get away from the heat lamp, like I said, because they can get too hot. You know, um, they can't warm themselves up, but they also can't cool themselves down as well. They just can't regulate their own body temperature. So um, you need to make sure they've definitely got a cold side as well. 
Um, so like I say, it's up to you guys really whether or not you want to hibernate your tortoises. Uh, but in my personal opinion, that's not something I would ever do just because it shouldn't be cold enough for them to hibernate really. So he's also got loads of scales on his legs um, and quite long claws. Now we don't ever clip the claws. We don't need to clip his claws. <clears throat> there should be something as in, in his enclosure which he can grind his claws down on. For example, just like a piece of slate or um, a brick, something like that. Something that um, isn't really going to look out of place in his enclosure. It isn't going to get in his get in his way, so he can't go to the other side. Um, but something that he can also stand on, he can walk on, and he can grind his claws down them as well. A really really good way of um, making sure they can grind the claws is giving them something that they can climb on um, like a little ladder or something up to a platform and then putting um, something really rough like sandpaper something like that um, on the actual ladder um, so when they climb up it they're actually filing the nails down as well because these guys are really adventurous when they're um, when they're awake uh, you know they are really really adventurous they love to climb Herbert's a really good climber um, <clears throat> so he does he does, um, you know, um, what I'm saying, he does start to um, go, not not to sleep, he kind of just slows down a little bit um, throughout the year. And that's completely normal, but, uh, but he is still awake. So in the months when he's slowing down, he doesn't really use his, his climbing frame. So you might, if you have him as a pet, you might start to think, um, you know, it's not getting much use out of it. But trust me, in the months when they're awake and when they're alert, they will use it. Um, and it's really important to grind their, their claws down as well. Um, so it's actually called brumation, what reptiles go through. So it's not hibernation. We don't we don't want to hibernate them. We just want them to, to calm down a little bit um, for about half the year or something like that, maybe even less than that, um, where they just they just really, really stop um, walking around and stuff. So they're still they're still awake, they're still eating. They're still drinking, um, but they're just not as um, as energetic as they are throughout the rest of the year. So he's also got this shell, which is, you know, really, really typical of tortoises um, and turtles. And he can actually feel everything I'm doing on his shell. So what we don't want to do is we don't want to be banging on his shell when we're handling him. We don't want to be scratching it or anything like that. We want to make sure we've got a nice tight grip of it because as you can see, he's really, really wiggly um, and he can easily push himself out because his legs are quite strong, so a nice tight grip. Um, but at the same time, we don't want to squeeze it really, really hard um, and we want to make sure we're using our tip, the tips of our fingers when we're stroking him as well. And that way it's nice and soft, exactly the same as you do with a dog or a cat. You don't want to grab hold of them. You don't want to squeeze them too hard. It's the same with these guys. Even though the shell is really, really hard, they can feel everything we're doing on it. So um, we need to make sure we're, we're careful with the shell. So I've already mentioned supplements and how they're really, really important. And that also links in with the shell as well. So the supplements provide him with um, things like calcium and stuff like that. And that helps his shell to grow. It helps his shell to harden. And without his shell, he's not going to do very well. All his organs and everything are Everything important is under his shell. So if he was to lose his shell, he's not he's, he's not going to survive. Um, if his shell starts to have issues on it, if it starts to rot away, there's a thing called shell rot, um, which they can get from, uh, which is basically a fungal disease, which they can get from not having enough supplements. Um, so supplements are really, really important in the diet. You can supplement every day, uh, but you need to be careful with the amount of supplement you're giving because... Um, too much, they won't be able to digest properly, they won't be able to process it properly, um, and then they're going to struggle to pass that through. So in terms of supplements, we supplement every day, but it's a really, really small sprinkle, um, and they get two different supplements. So it's definitely worth doing your research um, on the diet and the lifestyle of these guys before you get one. Um, the, biggest, the biggest issue with tortoises is how long they live. So if I was to get a tortoise now, I'm 24 years old. If I was to get one of these tortoises, this would this tortoise would be alive until I was 84 years old. So an average age for these guys is about 60 years, which is a long, long, long time. Um, it's a lifetime commitment. You know, I don't know if I'm going to live to 84, so it might have to be passed down as well. And you need to make sure if, you, if you're passing it down, they've got the correct knowledge. Um, they've done their research as well. 
the only reason he, he lives to 60 is because he's so small. If you get a little bit of a bigger species, usually the bigger they are, the longer they live. So um, if you're thinking about getting a really big species, they'll definitely need to be passed down because um, some species, the biggest species in the world, they can live up to 200. So uh, we're definitely not going to live that long. Um, so you need to make sure everybody in the family, if you're thinking about passing this on, is uh, has got a really, really good knowledge. If you're thinking about passing it on to somebody who's not in the family, you need to make sure they've read up on on, on them as well because they're, they're really, really hard to um, – they're not hard to, I don't want to say they're hard to look after because they're easy to look after, but it, you need to have the knowledge um, to, for them to have a healthy lifestyle, basically. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put, uh, put Herbert back now and we're going to meet Boris. Now, a lot of the stuff is going to be the same, um, but there are a few differences. So uh, we'll meet him and we'll speak about him as well. So this is Boris. Boris is our bearded dragon. There he is. There's his head. So Boris is um, an Australian species, so he's a bit different um, to Herbert. Um, he lives in a much, much hotter country uh, for the majority of the year. Um, Herbert lives in a cold country. Boris lives in a hot country all year round. He's, he's Australian. So uh, he also lives in the desert as well, which hardly gets any rain. Um, and that needs to be replicated in their, their uh, captive environment, really. So he, he will live in the same kind of setup as Herbert in, in a vivarium with a hot spot, um, a hot basking spot, also a cold spot as well, very important, uh, and also something they can climb on as well. These guys are really, really good climbers, much better climbers than um, the tortoises. So if he'll let me, if he lets go of my shirt, I'll try and show you his, his feet. So there's his feet and you can see he's got really long toes, especially the middle ones. And this is so he can grip onto things like rocks and stuff like that uh, and climb. Uh, and the main reason for this is because he's a prey animal. He gets eaten by lots of different things, um, especially bigger lizards. So when bigger lizards are chasing him, um, he needs to be able to climb to get out of their reach. These bigger lizards, um, things like parentes that live in Australia, they aren't great climbers. They can climb, but Boris is a much, much better climber um, than than the lizards, than the bigger lizards. So that's why he's got these uh, these long toes. Now, I need to stress that Boris is not named after the Prime Minister. It does say that on the bottom of the screen. We definitely didn't name him after the Prime Minister. So I'm just, uh, just making sure that people know that. So... <clears throat> As I say, he is a prey species, which is why it's important not to house him across from any snakes that he can see, um, even bigger lizards. If, if you're avid reptile keepers and you've got bigger lizards, make sure you don't house him um, near any of them. Birds of prey are a really big predator for him as well. So you need to make sure if you've got birds of prey, he isn't going anywhere near them because they'll likely try and eat him. Um, and just make sure he's comfortable, really. He's comfortable in where he's living. Um, and he's comfortable in um, his environment. So Boris is quite quite boring when he's sat in his viv. He'll literally just sit like this. He'll usually just sit under the heat light, trying to get nice and warm. Um, but the real fun with these guys comes when you get them out. So um, letting them out is, is absolutely fine. You can let them run around and stuff as long as they don't get too cold. So we're not going to keep them out for longer than an hour. We're going to put them back under his heat light after that. Um, but letting them out is really, really important. With the tortoises as well, actually, you can't just keep them in the viv. You know, a lot of the time you've got four foot, six foot vivs. Um, it's not a lot of space. So letting them out is really important um, for their well-being, really, so they don't get too bored. Uh, try and let them out every day if you can. Uh, if you can't let them out every day, then, you know, every other day is fine. Uh, the fun with Boris when he's when he's been let out comes in in feeding him, really. Now that's a big difference between him and uh, Herbert. Herbert's a herbivore, Boris is an insectivore. So that means he eats insects. So if you don't like insects, a bearded dragon isn't the animal for you. You can give them fruit and veg. Um, they will eat fruit and veg, but they can't just live off fruit and veg. Whereas they can just live off um, insects uh, because that's all they'll eat in the, in the desert, in the wild. They don't, in the desert in, in Australia, you know, apples aren't growing and blueberries aren't growing and things like that so um even though he will he will eat 
um, fruit and veg. Insects are the, the most important part of his diet. And that's really, really cool because um, it, you can get them out, you can get them to exercise, you can pop them on the floor and let them chase a locust around or a worm or um, a cockroach, anything like that. Um, but you need to make sure you're confident handling these insects because a lot of the time they don't catch them. Insects are really, really fast. Um, so you're going to have to catch them um, and then give him another go at catching them. So um, if you don't if you don't like insects, then a bearded dragon isn't the animal for you, unfortunately. So exactly the same as Herbert in the sense that um, he he's not going to hibernate. If he's if he's looking really lethargic um, and really really tired, um, then that's not good. You know, in the wild, a little bit different to Herbert. Herbert would hibernate in the wild in the wild these guys wouldn't hibernate um so again they go for a period where they're a little bit less um active um but they wouldn't hibernate um at any time of the year so if these guys are, are looking really tired and really lethargic you need to make sure your um your heat light is is up and that's where the thermostat comes in what i mentioned earlier so this is both for the tortoises and uh, the bearded dragons a thermostat is really really good for any reptile because um, it basically regulates the temperature of, of the heat light for you. So, um, you know, if you want it at a specific temperature, if you've done your research and you know the exact optimum temperature, which, which these guys should be kept at, then you can set the thermostat to that and the heat light will always be on that temperature. If it goes above that temperature, it'll turn off for a little bit. Uh, if it goes below that temperature, then it'll boost up and get hot or get warmer. Um, and then once it reaches that temperature, it will stay at that temperature. So thermostats are a very, very important part of um, a reptile setup. So as you can imagine, with everything I've said, really, um, the main cost of, of having a reptile comes with buying the setup. You need to make sure it's got a decent sized vivarium because you're not going to be able to let it out all the time. You need to make sure it's got the lights. Um, you know, UV, UV light is really important for um, these types of animals as well, a heat light. Um, you need to make sure it's got things it can climb on, a thermostat, um, a temperature probe as well, all those different kind of things, um, which would basically mean you've got the, the basic necessities to have one of these animals. You can't just get one of these animals and keep them in your house. That's not um, going to be good for these guys. They're going to end up with diseases. They're going to end up with... Um, bone diseases especially, because the UV um, is really, really good for their bones, especially when they're younger. The supplements and the UV are really, really important to, to these guys for their uh, the, the bone growth. So that's uh, the most important thing really is the setup. And then after that, caring for them is really easy. Tortoises, feed them every day, making sure you're supplementing uh, really small amounts. With the bearded dragons, we feed uh, Boris every other day, so we give him a star day every other day because that kind of replicates what you get in the wild, mainly giving him insects, but also providing fruit and veg as well. He hardly ever eats the fruit and veg, but it's worth providing it just in case they do want it. Provides them with a little bit of um, fiber for the diet as well. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much it. Making sure you're handling them, making sure you're letting them out so they've got space to run around and things like that. Um, and they are actually really, really loving pets. As you can see with Boris, He's very, very friendly. You can give him a cuddle. You can give him a little kiss. He's really, really friendly. He doesn't mind it. Um, bearded dragons are really, really laid back. Um, so he will never, ever, ever bite me. Um, you know, unless I did something really, really bad to hurt him, like grab his head or something like that, which I'm not going to do. Um, I can, you know, smush him as much as I want to, and he would never um, do anything because he actually really likes human contact um, because it's what he's been brought up on. Um, so reptiles are actually really, really loving animals as well. And they're a good alternate to dogs because you don't have to walk them. So if you're not a big, big fan of exercise like me, then um, they're definitely the, the animal for you, for sure. So we'll pop them back. Thank you. And we'll just go on to the next one, which is just a quick recap. So we've looked at both the tortoises and the bearded dragons. And we've looked at um, the pros and cons of, of owning them. So uh, we need to make sure um, we actually include the cons as well in our leaflets. 
So, um, you know, we're making sure that um, we're talking about the fact we have to do loads of research for them and they've got loads of different needs as well. Probably more needs than keeping keeping mammals for sure. So uh, we met Herbert and, and Boris and just make sure you're doing your homework. That'd be really, really appreciated um, if you can create a leaflet for um, just one of them, if you want to create a leaflet for both of them. But again, if you want to create a leaflet for your pets that you've got at home, if you've got a really interesting exotic pet um, that we might not be showing you this week, um, then that'd be really cool as well. I've had um, a really, really cool entry from the Spain family on, uh, they've created a leaflet on keeping a, a, a python. So it's really, really interesting. They are a little bit early because we're gonna be talking about our python on Friday um, and I might steal some of their ideas so I don't have to do any research about um, the python so I can literally just read their leaflet and then I can relay it to you guys. So <laughs> now I'm not gonna be doing that. Um, but if you guys, the Spain family, want to tune in on Friday, then hopefully I can uh, I can elaborate on the leaflet a little bit. I can maybe tell you a few things that uh, you guys weren't aware of as well. Uh, we're not too sure, but I'm guessing you've got a, a pet python because there is some really, really good information on on how to keep a, a python in, in that leaflet. So uh, big, big thank you for that. Uh, we really, really do appreciate getting the homework back in because then we know people are actually watching the streams and they're actually um you know they're interacting with us as well so that's really cool so the final slide is um just a slide to say thanks for listening basically uh, we've got a couple of things to bring to your attention so if you go on our facebook page for some reason um facebook don't seem to like us very much and and don't really share our our posts um, as much as we'd want. So we want to try and push our, our Facebook page as much as possible. We've got a raffle on there, which is a uh, three pound a ticket. There's a hundred numbers. Um, and if you if your number gets drawn out, then you win a gold adoption package, which, which we've spoken about earlier. You get to come in and meet your animal one-to-one. -one, uh, you get to spend time with it just on your own and things like that. Um, so it's a really, really good prize. So if you can get involved with that, uh, that would be awesome. We've also got the bingo on as well. That's just a pound per card. So you're winning. If you win a line, just get one line first. You get some chocolates. And then if you get the, the full house, the bingo, then that's for an animal experience. And take it from me, the animal experiences are really, really cool, um, especially the meerkat experience and the skunk experience. Awesome. It's a, it's a really, really hands-on experience. If you have a look on our Facebook page, you'll be able to see some posts of uh, reviews from people who have done um, our animal experiences and also some pictures from the keepers who have run the animal experiences um, and every time we do it it's a success we also do a reptile um, animal experience as well so if you've enjoyed the talk today um, you can come meet some of our other reptiles you can come meet Boris and Herbert again you can also meet um, our really big snakes um, and our chameleon and things like that as well so it's well worth doing the bingo is definitely worth doing because if you win an animal, animal experience um, you won't regret it, definitely. And for a pound, um, it's definitely worth a, worth a shot. We've also got the fundraiser, which I'm sure if you've um, watched us before, you've, you've heard about it. Now, the fundraiser is um, basically because we don't have any money coming in at the minute, and it is a really, really big struggle for us to um, look after our animals, give them the, everything that they need. You know, it's not just about feeding and uh, watering our animals. As I've mentioned, we need to give them all round care. Now, this has been quite a long talk. You've heard all the all the needs that just two of our animals have. We've got over 50 individuals here. Um, so giving them the correct care costs money. And with us not being able to go out to schools and, and do our thing, it uh, makes it really difficult getting money in. So it, even if you could just spare, you know, a pound, you know, two pound, anything like that, um, it will be really, really appreciated. You can do that uh, via the, the crowdfunding link, which is on the page, or also through um, Melissa's PayPal, which the link's on the screen there as well. So thank you very, very much for listening. Um, we're really looking forward to seeing your leaflets. Hopefully you come up with some really cool ideas. Um, and you've got Stacy tomorrow, and then I'm back on Friday. So um, hopefully uh, we'll see you tune in then as well. Cheers.